previously on Avatar. You're looking at the only waterbender in the whole South Pole. Jesus, I'm not the biggest fan of the previously on Avatar segments in general, but this one is one of the worst. I know it's supposed to jog your memory for the episode to come, but I feel like this one going all the way back to the first episode is a little too heavy handed for me. Huh, not a different line read in the recap this time, but a different sound effect. There's a new one. Here's sweat bending the first time, and here it is in the recap. Oh, it's the episode where the phase of the moon matters, guys. Let's open with a shot of the moon looking very full. Does it look too full? Just put the lightest shadow ever on the left side of it. It doesn't count then. What about the next shot? Yeah, I just make it a circle. Another thing to mention in the shot is that we see the moon over the mountain that's important later in this episode. And even the field of fire lilies that Hama messes up later. The blade of wing fun was haunted! I think I liked the man with the sword for a hand better. Man door hand sword car door. In this shot, it looks like Toph's shoes are back to not being kicked out in the bottom. Is this one of those, a friend of my cousin knew some guy that this happened to stories? No, it happened to mom. I don't even remember who that looks like. Mom turned and saw Nini standing by the fire. She was blue, like she was frozen. Well, human spirits are very blue in this world, so Kaya's story might check out, honestly. <laughs> Guys, did you hear that? I hear people under the mountain, and they're screaming. All right, so Momo being rattled here would actually have me believe that he can understand human speech, but we've been over the fact that he can't. Weird. Hello, children. Ah! Wait, 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 wait. We've literally just set up that Toph can hear slash feel people screaming underground from very far away. We know her seismic sense is crazy. She can even feel Combustion Man coming when she's asleep. So how does Hama sneak up on the gang here? Toph is literally a living radar. How does anyone get within a hundred yards of them without her knowing? You know, you should be careful. People have been disappearing in those woods you were camping in. When the moon turns full, people walk in and they don't come out. I'm saving it. I'm saving the moon tirade for later. It's coming. Wakey, wakey. Time to go shopping. Interesting contrast between Sokka's reaction to shopping here and his reaction four episodes ago. Shopping! I guess if he's not looking for an instrument to kill people with, it's not as fun. That Mr. Yao seems to have a thing for you. Maybe we should go back and see if he'll give us some free Komodo sausages. Don't worry, Hama. If he doesn't, Katara will simply steal this man's products with zero remorse. You won't have any ash bananas till next week? Well, I have to send the boy to Hingwa Island to get them, and it's a two-day trip. Ash bananas are largely found on Hingwa Island. Pay attention, this will be on the test. I bet if we take a little walk around town, we'll find out what these people did to the environment to make the spirits mad. I like that Aang's thinking harkens back to the Spirit World episode where much of the same thing was happening, villagers being abducted by a spirit. So Aang naturally figures it's some nature spirit that's pissed off at people for doing something. I like that a lot. And then you can sew up this little mystery lickety-split Avatar style. Helping people. That's what I do. I also really like that Ed kind of gasses himself up here. He's like, hell yeah, I'm the Avatar, baby. Which is rare for him, honestly. She's hiding something. That's ridiculous. She's a nice woman who took us in and gave us a place to stay. She kind of reminds me of Grand Grand. This is a super weird one, but you can see a face in this cabbage here. I've heard people say that it looks like Grand Grand as Katara brings her up as it's on screen, but I don't know, this just kind of looks like a horrible witch face to me. Sokka? Sokka, what are you doing? You can't just snoop around someone's house. Sokka, you're gonna get us all in trouble. I don't know, you're a traveling band of mean motherfuckers, Katara. You literally rocked up on the Earth King and kicked his fucking door down. Getting in trouble with anyone seems like it should be kind of an afterthought. <laughs> Okay, that's pretty creepy. I mean, I don't want to be close-minded, but if you have a collection of puppets, I do think you're 10% creepier than the average person. It's like having eyes that bulge out of your head or wearing an anime shirt to school. It's empty, except for a little chest. <gasps> Maybe it's treasure. I mean, it's for science. They should check if it's treasure. I have to see what's in there. Wait, what? How did you- Maybe there's a key here somewhere. Oh, hand it over. Wow, this is the one and only episode that Toph's meteor bracelet ever comes in handy. Does she even wear it for the rest of the show? I'll keep an eye out. This is crazy. I'm leaving. Suit yourself. Do it, Toph. It's funny that Katara immediately jumps back to see what's in the box as soon as she hears it open. I'll tell you what's in the box. Funnier still is that Toph doesn't care at all that Hama caught them. She's on the same wavelength as me. They're a crack squad. What is she going to do to them? 
Sokka, where's your nose? Of course, I can't get all the ingredients I need here, but ocean kumquats are a lot like sea prunes if you stew them long enough. Oh, great. This is a little reference to Bato of the Water Tribe. Bato had some sea prunes on the fire, and Aang, well, he wasn't a fan. Yeah, Oppa's kind of just hand-waved away this entire episode. He's sleeping in a cave in one of the first shots, and then apparently he just chills in this barn for like two entire days in a row? Sounds hellish for a big guy like him. And how did you explain your enormous cow monster to the kindly old lady? Who wants five flavors soup? Uh, Toph didn't actually want any Hama. Please take your soup back. Also, this is the second instance of soup bending in two episodes. There's just as many soup bending episodes as there is blood bending episodes in this show. I was stolen from my home. It was over 60 years ago when the raid started. Cool that the Southern Water Tribe used to be more substantial back then and not the rinky-dink little circle of igloos and teepees Sokka and Katara know. Also in this shot, I'd believe that these are supposed to be people, which means these people are either flying or hanging from this tower's rooftop. All right, I've been waiting to talk about this too. Remember way back in the Waterbending Master when I said not letting female waterbenders fight was stupid as hell? Well, I got a lot of really sexist comments, but a lot more people saying that in wars like the Hundred Years War in real life women didn't fight. And my response to that is that you're missing the point entirely. I don't care what gender the person is. If they are literally magic and can cut rocks into pieces by waving their arms around for five seconds, you should let them fight your war. It's just brain dead not to. We did our best to hold them off. This is the same Fire Nation ship from all the way back in episode one. Hama had a hand in putting it there. The shots of Hama being captured share a lot of the same shots of Aang being captured in episode two. Like a lot of them are pretty much exactly the same shot, which is a really cool thing for them to do. Oh, and canonically the girl here who bears a striking resemblance to Katara is Grand Grand. Just thought you should know. I was the only one who managed to escape. How did you get away? Blood bending. I'd like to teach you what I know so you can carry on the southern tradition when I'm gone. Yes! It's cool that Katara gets another master here suddenly. It's been a season and a half since she was anyone's student, so I like that she's suddenly the one learning again. This show is really good at keeping things fresh with each character. Did you know you can even pour water out of thin air? We're finally entering the end game of the that makes sense moments for bending. Once again, things are paced out amazingly. If Katara learned this kind of thing earlier on, it probably would have become a staple of the show and the writers would have had to write around it a lot. Katara learning the possibility of this now adds up better to why we never see her actually do it. But it's still cool to see that it can be done. They were really smart about this. This has got to be the nicest natural setting in the Fire Nation. I don't see anything that would make a spirit mad around here. You know what? I've been thinking the same damn thing, eh? In fact, every town they've gone to has been pretty well off. No big issues. Except the one in the Painted Lady. A lot of people want to talk about that that episode is pointing out the fact that the Fire Nation is having a negative effect on their own population. But they don't. It's that one town. That's it. With the propaganda in the kids, you can extrapolate that all the kids in the entire Fire Nation are learning the same thing. So that hits home. But saying that the Fire Nation are harming their own people when every single town we see is doing fine minus the one of the painted lady doesn't seem right to me the fire nation is fucking over that one town everyone else is fine excuse me sir can you tell us anything about the spirit that's been stealing people only one man ever saw it and lived. I love the spooky music that kicks in here suddenly that's super funny also since when is the strap for your sword green All right, Hama, that was pretty cool. The pacing and atmosphere in this episode on its own is really good too. You're instantly unsettled with Hama with her introduction, but she lulls you into this sense of security over and over. But more and more she says creepy shit or delivers lines strangely or kills a bunch of flowers. So never once are you totally sure she's gonna be the villain. You get the feeling, but it's never confirmed until everything boils over later, which is really awesome writing. Old man ding? Damn, there are just as many someone hitting their thumb with a hammer episodes as there are bloodbending episodes. There's no boards on Old Man Ding's windows in this shot, but when Aang helps him put one up, there's already one there. And then a few shots later, there's suddenly three up there. Didn't see no spirit. 
Just felt something come over me, like I was possessed. Yeah, this is just paced really, really well. Hama just mentioned all living things have water in them, and this guy is saying that he was possessed. You've got just enough hints now to put it together yourself. And even if you don't, once it is revealed, you can kind of think back to what the show has already told you, and you're like, Oh shit, I should have fucking thought of that. This might be one of the most solidly written episodes in the entire show. Yeah, there she is. So I have to bring up the point that on about 90% of the episodes of this damn show, it's a full moon. Hama being only able to act out a revenge once a month seems like a pretty good limiting factor, but if you've been paying attention, it turns out Hama can go around bending people pretty much any day of the week. We're saved! Remember the puppets from Hama's closet? Well, a few of them actually look to be modeled after our prisoners in here. This one looks like this guy, these two match up, and these ones too. That's like pretty dark, right? I like that they set up Toph can pick locks with her meteor bracelet earlier in the episode so she can actually get these people out of here without metal bending. Hey look, it's an owl cat. We saw one of those back in a pet store in Bossing Say. And I passed years developing the skill that would lead to my escape. Blood bending. I'm gonna sound like a broken record here, but the way this episode builds up to this moment is so awesome. Everything is revealed so slowly until it finally ramps up to Hama rapidly revealing everything all at once. It's just really good, man. Fuck. They threw me in prison to rot, along with my brothers and sisters. They deserve the same. Oh my god, the animation on this lady goes crazy too. The sound design for blood bending, the way they draw her. Everything goes to 11 in these last few minutes. It's wild. <laughs> You should have learned the technique before you turned against me. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you on that one. You're not the only one who draws power from the moon. My bending is more powerful than yours, Hama. Your technique is useless on me. Okay, for as good as this episode is, I really hate this. Katara's bending is more powerful than Hama's? What? What is this, Dragon Ball Z? What does more powerful mean? Can Katara move more water? Does she have more water pressure? This show has done an awesome job of having fights decided by skill and intelligence and by mastery over one's discipline, not by having a higher power level. I think this is a major misstep in the writing, and I'm really glad they never bring anything like this back. With that out of the way, this fight is really cool. It's cool to see Katara immediately use some of the stuff Hama has taught her and they're ripping trees apart and shit it's very visually striking oh and check this shit out in this big shot of katara blocking hama's attack you can actually see katara and hama's reflections in the little water droplets that's some pretty crazy attention to detail like who would have even thought to include that i also really love here that hama kind of takes a stance like she's using a marionette as she controls Sokka. seems like she probably gets some practice out of actually using the puppets back home and hama's a very uniquely powerful villain she's like a new kind of threat kind of like combustion man crazy that we're getting down to the end of this show and we're still finding new ways to threaten the group. It's really cool. Alright, is Katara learning bloodbending immediately just by feel a good moment? No, probably not. Paku said she did very well very quickly, but it was more because of her hard work, not because she was innately talented. So Katara just getting this crazy new kind of bending on her first try kind of spits in the face of what she's about. She's worked for what she has. So this episode is really good, despite stumbling a bit at the end. It's like a mystery episode and the buildup is written super well. You get just enough info at the right pace to start putting things together for yourself. And you're like, can waterbenders do that? And then Hama's like, yeah, I can do that. It's really cool. I really don't like Katara's DBZ moment or her nailing bloodbending right away, but that's not enough to sour the whole episode for me. The writing's just too good. This one is a really good one. Alright, so this worked last time, so I want to do it again. My videos usually get, like, quite a few more views than my actual subscriber count, so if you're not subscribed and you're watching it and you enjoyed it, please subscribe. Like I've mentioned, my dumb lizard brain likes to see number go up. So yeah, if you're not subscribed, please sub. Thank you! Patron shoutouts! If you want to be two episodes ahead of the YouTube releases, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link as always this is in the description below the video. Shoutouts to my top patrons, Agent Rhino, who can do a one-finger pull-up. Bradley Ralph, who was the first human to have a natural exoskeleton. Brendan Murphy, who has laser vision with the same power as a magnifying glass held up to the sun. Donnie Snow, who lay dormant in the Arctic for thousands of years until being awakened just recently. Dylan Calvo, who has ridden one of every animal on Earth. Elder Xandanthus, who can turn anything they touch into silver, but you don't really get a story written about you for that. Caitlin, who actually likes black licorice, which makes her the toughest person on the planet. Kennedy Stapleton, 
Hamilton, who can survive any fall if the number of feet is an odd number. It's quite the gamble. Lou Carrera, who scientists keep calling peak human evolution. Mandatory Sin, who is the reason I drink. Literally. Mike the Wizard, who sleeps on a bed of nails and likes it too. Nick Kaipanen, who has won every kind of contest except eating. Omega Fighter, who shaves with a flaming claymore. Skylos, who unlocked camouflage just recently. Useless Princess Backwards, who actually only is capable of walking backwards as well. Tiago Nascimento, who is known as the Sky God in most ancient societies. Tom, happy belated 21st birthday from me and Verity. Hope it was a good one. Verunda, who shot an elastic band into the eye of the last Cyclops to kill it. And Zumpy, who has access to a button that calls down one Martian airstrike wherever he wants. Use it well. And my other fuck you money patrons, Andrew Edwards, Bra Man from the Fifth Floor, Buddha Jacker, Caps Lock, Charlie Rock Quigley, Daniel Ward, Eric Barney, etc. Fritz Sullivan, Garrett Kane, Harrison P., Jared Berkman, Jess, John, Keith Clausen, Phantom Lord Daddy, Sean Merton, The Sinking Bubble, and You Frickin' Nerd. And of course my god analyzers, Ahsoka, Ash Latano, Alex Fritz, Ali, QPZM, Austin Gallup, Be My Valentine, Big Thirsty, Brand Muffin, Bingo Dingo, Canine Corpse, Kevin Yagi, Chase Brignac, Chris Dolmet, Dan Bertel, Daniel Nordzig, David Carlisle, Derek Cornwell, DJ Jax, Do Mutual Aid, Dominic Saint, Distent, Earth 2 John, Eleanor Rose, Epic Goomba, Eric Ross, Glintlock, Gub Gub, Homie One Kenobi, Hype King, It's Carton, Jay Lambo, Jeremy Rubenstein, Jimbo, John Ajaka, Jop Moreland, Joshua Bone, Joshua Haskett, Juice Pouch Grape, Justin Scott, Kadex, Keon Gilliland, Lady Serena, Lehman Russ, Lord Draken, 7367, Matthew Stargell, Mr. Airborne, Mitchell Gobrek, Mortius 007, Nickel Pickle 582, Nicholas Abbott, Omar, Parker Malarker, Peyton Mims, Peter Bayron, Radiator Rat, Rocket Mist, Shadow Fox Nero, Sky Not Darken, Stein One, Pseudo Burger, Super Snipper, Tiny Knight, Travis Chestnut, Triad Juice, Wales Red, and Wolfman Dan. Next up is Nightmares and Daydreams. Ha ha ha.